just the New Zealand economy that foreign vessels are having an impact on. We will show how their fishing practices are severely hurting the New Zealand domestic fleet, forcing many out of the industry. They don't give a damn about the New Zealand fishing industry. They have no vested interest in it. They've invested no money into it. All they're doing is raping and pillaging it until they're finished, and as soon as they've destroyed our fishery here, they'll just move on to another country. There's plenty of fish out there. We, we just can't get the access to that fish because the foreigners are in there ahead of us. I think it's fairly unfair that New Zealand fishermen should be having their boats tied up and a lack of fish to catch when you've still got foreign vessels fishing and the New Zealand water's catching our fish because it is our fish. A great fleet of New Zealand boats and smaller boats will be gone. They just won't be there anymore. And you'll look out your window and see a uh, Korean boat towing down the bay instead of a couple of small New Zealand boats. This is big stuff. If you want your own country to catch your own product, then I think it's paramount that the government takes a stand here. We don't need joint ventures. We've got enough boats in New Zealand to catch all our quota. Why should they come here? It's not a question of being jingoistic or, or narrow-minded. It's just a question of being smart in the way you go about your national economic business. I mean, what we're doing here is diminishing our GDP uh, by giving part of it away to foreign people. New Zealand's fishing fleet is in trouble. In the last 10 years, it has declined by over 50%, from 2,500 boats down to 1,200 boats, 75 of them gone in the last three months. It soon becomes obvious why this is when fishermen explain the impact foreign fishing boats are having on their catches. Last time we are out here, first tow we had 140 a Terakee, cases of Cherokee, it was 68 of dogs and about 15 bins of other fish. Nine? Nine bins of fish in total. We went out there and started blue nosing and started doing quite good. And the, the Russians turned out there. And the whole thing just fell to bits on us. Like I watched, I'd watched this little living I was making just disappear. They turned up and the fish disappeared. While New Zealand fishermen now want all foreign fishing vessels out of New Zealand waters, in the early 70s they were welcomed to help develop our deep water fisheries. In the early 1970s, New Zealanders ate about 147 pounds of meat per person per year, and they ate nine pounds of fish. So even the, 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 the still Catholic Friday, where most Catholics were expected to eat fish, was not a big contributor to a fishing industry. Most of the fishermen went out for a day or two days and caught things like snapper or terakee or gurnet or something like that, which was very, very much an inshore fishery. There was no, nothing, nothing deep water at all. So partnerships were formed with numerous foreign fishing nations. In exchange for their expertise and research, the New Zealand government let them catch and take away thousands of tonnes a year of our deep water fish. This became a, a rather controversial issue. New Zealand fish should be for New Zealanders. Yes, that was fine, it was a good idea. But New Zealanders had to learn how to, how to deal and treat the fish, how to fish it, how to get it in, into a boat and get it somewhere. And they weren't very good at doing that. So, so there was this, this problem that they needed those joint ventures. The problem was no one was keeping proper catch records. Right from the very beginning when, when the foreigners were here, they were taking away you know, large quantities of fish that, that none of us guys, or probably none of anyone, really knew how much they would, were actually catching. Even in the 1970s, people didn't know what fish was there and how many and whether the, whether the beds were depleted. They thought they were. They thought that the, the number of fish was starting to drop. That's hardly surprising, considering that in 1977 alone, foreign vessels had caught over 360,000 tonnes of fish. This was six times the total landed by New Zealand fishermen. And this is where you got the development of the, of the quota management system because they realised that they couldn't continue to fish without regulation. To protect New Zealand's valuable fish resource, 
the quota management system became law in 1986. The quota management gave quota, which was like a property, to you if you had catch history. So if you'd been fishing in 1981, 1982, and you'd caught 100 tonnes of snapper, well, you were probably given quota for that amount. That was the sort of principle in which it worked. It was your catch history, which you gave the quota. Now, that quota was your property, just like a house or a car or your fishing boat. The new quota system gave large New Zealand companies the security they needed, and they began investing millions of dollars in their own factory trawlers. We were seeing the introduction of vessels like the Ameltel Columbia, the Ameltel Atlantis, Sea Lords invested a significant amount of money in deep sea trawlers, Sanfords did the same, and a number of independent companies with the express purpose of providing the opportunity for New Zealand owned jobs and running those operations on the basis that they could harvest their own quota in their own country with their own people. But there were still New Zealanders chartering foreign vessels to catch their new quota holdings. This was legal. Although only New Zealanders could own quota, they were free to choose who caught that quota. 1989 was the peak year for foreign vessels, with 424 of them fishing in New Zealand waters. But the tide was turning. What was happening generally in the New Zealand scene was that firstly the joint ventures were starting to be wound down and you got what we call New Zealandization of fishing and this was where local companies really took over the fishing for the deep sea, for the hokey, for the orange roughy, for all the major, major fisheries really. I guess they thought why pay charter boats, foreign boats to come and do it when we can do it ourselves, you know, we do have the experience, we have the knowledge and there were, there were the vessels around the world, so they went and bought them and got on with it. And I suppose it's just the old typical Kiwi can do sort of thing, you know. They just thought to hell that we can do it ourselves, let's get on with it and do it. The height of New Zealandisation of the fishing industry was in 1996, when there were over two and a half thousand New Zealand owned fishing vessels. That was when the fishing industry was at its greatest point of strength because the New Zealand companies were actually able to, to do a lot with the resources that they had and actually manage the fisheries very well. New Zealandisation of our fishing industry was, was a huge success because one part of it we're using all these foreigners to catch our fish and a, a very short few years later we've got our own big fleet, you know, of world class trawlers. And the intentions were when the joint ventures got introduced into New Zealand or the charter vessels originally was that they were only intended to be there until such time as New Zealanders had the ability and the vessels capable to catch the fish. We developed our own skills and, and uh, got our own fleet of New Zealand owned boats and, and the New Zealandisation was meant to fade them out and it just never happened. To the dismay of domestic fishermen, the popular New Zealandisation programme was sabotaged by New Zealand company accountants. All that mattered was the bottom line. A lot of the companies realised that they could make a lot of money out of these foreign boats that pay low wages and run their boats a lot cheaper and not as well maintained. The reality is the joint ventures were in a position where they could achieve the same outcomes for a lot less money. So they've been slowly selling off their modern boats and getting more and more fish chartered out to foreign countries to catch their fish. This was a kick in the guts to the New Zealand fishing industry working force as a whole because the playing field was not level. And you can see why when you compare the annual wage bill for a New Zealand vessel with a rotating crew of 40 to the annual wage bill of a foreign vessel with a crew of 80. It does um, benefit a group of New Zealanders and they make a massive profit out of it because they're paying cheap wages. There are over one and a half thousand quota owners, some owning as little as several thousand kilos of quota to the larger holdings of tens of thousands of tonnes. Any New Zealander can own quota as it is traded on an open market like any commodity. 
It is estimated that about 40% of quota is owned by people who are not fishermen, own no fishing boats nor fish processing factories and have quota as one would have stocks and shares. Foreign vessels hired by New Zealand companies catch 45% of New Zealand's deep sea quota. They have no overheads with the vessels. They don't belong to them, they don't have to upkeep them. So, you know, their costs are, are pretty minimal. Then if they own their own vessels, which they had to upkeep, had their own crew, which they had to pay above the standard they pay for a foreign crew, it eats into the profits. So what's more important, job for Kiwis or profit? To industrial strife in Littleton, where the crew of another New Zealand joint venture fishing vessel has gone on strike. The crew of the Nova Nicole says their trawler is nothing but a slave ship. Now these slaves are on strike. They say since unloading their catch early this month, the Russian owners have refused to pay their $37 a week wages for five months at sea. Through my job as the union organiser, I have come into contact with um, foreign fishermen coming to us for help. We seem to be the only organisation that are prepared to put their hand up and try and do something for them. Most of them um, seem to be wage related. And Victor, how long is it since you've received any wages, any salary? It is the usual answer, about four months. So it's not just New Zealand fishermen being screwed by New Zealand companies hiring foreign vessels. The third world wages paid to foreign crews are the only reason these companies are using these vessels to catch their quota. And the government has always hidden behind the Fisheries Act in answer to criticism for its lack of action. Initially, whilst Section 103.5 of the Fisheries Act states quite clearly that the Minimum Wages Act and the Wages Protection Act apply. My experience of the application of this legislation was patchy. There's been a lot of speculation and conjecture about just what they are paid and these guys come over here on third world country wages as it were, competing with our own people that are working their asses off to achieve what they could. So there's always been that level of concern about the level playing field. And if there is any doubt about such low wages, just listen to the amounts these crew are owed for six months' work. 10,000. 4,000. 7,000. How long? For six months. Normally what will happen is that amount will be paid to the crewing agent. And from there, it's very difficult to track whether it's been dispersed by the crewing agent back to the individual crew members. The biggest thing we do come across is, in the end, we can't establish what they are entitled to. Um, we've, we've tried, we've, we, and it's just virtually impossible. Of the four largest fishing companies, only one does not use foreign vessels to catch their deep sea quota. Sanford, New Zealand's largest fishing company, has its own fleet but uses Korean vessels to catch a significant percentage of its quota. This is Sea Lord's last deep sea factory trawler, having sold off its other three several years ago. It now uses five Russian factory trawlers to catch most of its quota. The fourth largest company is Independent Fisheries. For years it chartered this Polish vessel to catch all its deep sea quota. This year, they replaced it with these two Russian vessels. Other large New Zealand quota owners use foreign vessels extensively as well. 45% of all New Zealand's deep sea quota is caught by foreign vessels. There are a small number of um, companies and individuals making a lot of money out of the use of foreign vessels and using foreign crew. And it's not in the interest of these parties to level the playing field. The figures that we see are, are, are what the fishing companies put up, so you know, you've just got to take it for granted, well, treat everybody as being honest. And um, some of these, you know, and we certainly have some of them saying to us that this is not correct, but then you get into a predicament, well who do you believe and who don't you believe? With the best intentions of the world, 
a charterer may think he's been paying a minimum wage multiplied by the number of hours required by the legislation, it could be that these crew members at the end of the day are still being exploited and not receiving what they're due in terms of um, New Zealand legislation. And it's very difficult to track, track the money. And in the end, you can't get it the bank accounts? No, the bank accounts we can't get to. It's like, um, you know, we've had, yes, X amount has been sent over to um, wherever it may be and they will pick it up when they get there. We can only take their word for that. Because one of the other things we do find is a lot of the fishermen, when they get back home, we never hear from them again. Um, what happens, we don't know. We've just got to take you know, what people tell us as being correct. So do you, suspect, do you suspect that the, the crews that have kicked up a bit of a stink are blacklisted? I definitely would say that, yes. Yes, I, I, I certainly believe that um, for everyone that's complained, they've not come back here with work. Crew members, particularly in um, um, less developed countries, such as Indonesia or uh, Myanmar, payments are often made in cash and not into bank accounts, in which case the trail becomes even more difficult to follow. There's been a lot of speculation and conjecture about just what they are paid, and these guys come over here on third world country wages, as it were, competing with our own people that are working their asses off to achieve what they could. So there's always been that level of concern about the level playing field. What happens is that on a New Zealand vessel, you have watches. Now, if you only catch a small bag of fish and it can be processed within inside your watch, and there's downtime, which I mean, you can either go and sit in the galley or uh, whatever the, the deck boss or the, or the factory manager allows you to do, you can, but during that period of time is your work time. And it's, uh, you don't go to work ashore and, and get to work and they, they, all of a sudden there's a power cut and everybody sits down. The boss doesn't deduct your wages there, but this is what the foreigners are doing. You know, they're getting downtime, so the owners are deducting that time, that downtime, out of their pay. They could be 60 hours on watch or 80 hours on watch with Norm on a fishing boat but they'll still only get their 38 hours, and that's it. If they paid them the wage for the hours really worked, or the hours they were on the vessel, then it would probably be on an equal basis. Any responsibility is passed on to the employment agency they may use over in the Ukraine, Russia, Philippines, anywhere like that, and the owners of the vessel. They arrange everything. It really seems to come down to the crewing agent in yep. the end, doesn't it? Yep, yep. And there, there and it can be the problem. There lies the problem. You don't know what's happening, how, how people, people buy jobs. Um, yeah, you, you just have no... I don't, uh, um, the ITF, the Transport International Transport Federation, don't. We don't know what happens. But all we know is that when they arrive on our doorstep, they are very, very scared people. Department of Immigration figures show that over the last 10 years there have been 490 ship desertions from foreign vessels. And when you see conditions on board these vessels, it's not hard to see why. After the break, we will show how these deplorable conditions impact financially on New Zealand fishermen. Observers are employed by the Ministry of Fisheries to monitor regulation compliance and can be at sea for up to three months. The most important role that an observer has is to police the fishing quotas for fishing vessels. If we didn't have observers on vessels at sea, New Zealand's resources would be um, fished out. So it's vital that every foreign vessel that operates within New Zealand's waters has an observer on board. But they don't. Observers would rather spend more time on New Zealand vessels than on foreign vessels. There are a lot of vessels uh, that are foreign owned charters that are not monitored. We don't have observers on them because the conditions on the vessels are unsafe. 
It's not surprising that observers are refusing to do duty on board many of these foreign fishing vessels when they have to work in conditions like this. For many observers it's a matter of safety and health, and it's not hard to see why. And often their accommodation can be just as deplorable. But it's not just the physical risks that put observers off policing foreign vessels. The psychological impact, no one talks to you for six weeks. People making it very clear when you come onto the vessel, you're not wanted. And very small ways that they can do that by, by not providing certain things, such as a mattress on the bed, you get the worst cabin on the vessel. It can be a range of things. It can be very subtle um, points that we don't want you here to be quite blatant um, attacks on the individual. We pursued with government and companies to bring the standards of foreign fishers up to New Zealand standards, but once again this was left on deaf ears. It's not hard to see why observers prefer to police New Zealand vessels rather than foreign vessels. This is a typical cabin for New Zealand crew, with private ensuite bathrooms. These are foreign crew cabins with communal ablution areas. Your daily meals cooked here or here. It's hardly surprising that observers would rather spend their six weeks eating here, rather than here. Unless something is done dramatically now, the New Zealand domestic fleet is going to be penalised because the observers would rather sail on the New Zealand boats, which once again is putting a burden on their uh, economy and, and economics of running the vessel, where the other ones are getting away scot-free. The Ministry of Fisheries charges $800 a day for one observer to be on a fishing vessel. For a New Zealand trawler this size, on a standard six-day trip, the observer bill will be $4,800. She will make 45 trips this year. Ocean-going factory trawlers like this one are at sea for six weeks, and observer charges reach a staggering $33,500. She will make seven trips this year and will often have two observers on board. It does seem pretty disproportionate, doesn't it, that, that a, a foreign charter vessel can fish in our waters without having anyone keep an eye on them as much as a Kiwi vessel can fish in our own waters um, and, and we have to pay the, the lion's share of the cost for it. it. It does seem so ridiculous. It's not just New Zealand fishermen who are being penalised unfairly our economy suffers as well. New Zealand companies charter foreign vessels because they can make so much more money from crews being paid low wages, and to add to this disgrace that by their dealings they deprive the New Zealand economy, and therefore all New Zealanders, of much needed revenue. This New Zealand vessel last year contributed four and a half million dollars into the New Zealand economy, through wages spent in the community, and the payment of PAYE and ACC levies. This Russian vessel contributed nothing. Neither did this Korean vessel. If New Zealandization had been allowed to continue and all foreign vessels had been replaced by New Zealand owned vessels and New Zealand crews, it is estimated that from 1996 to today over three and a half billion dollars of wages, income taxes and, as we show later, substantial earnings from high quality fish products would have gone into the New Zealand economy. It just brings us right back to the old uh, Kiwi fish thing. Wouldn't it be nice to have a whole lot of Kiwis earning $750 or $1,000 a week catching Kiwi fish um, rather than foreigners out here earning a couple hundred dollars American a week and taking that couple hundred dollars away. And it would be pretty cool if there were a whole lot more people making that reasonable wage, 
hence get rid of the foreigners and let us get on with doing our job. New rules guaranteeing better wages and conditions for crew on foreign fishing vessels have been announced. The government rule changes for foreign fishing boats working our waters follow a report last year which suggested the crews were being exploited. Finally, after years of pressure from within the fishing industry, the government acted in 2006. Foreign fishing crews will be paid at least $1.25 above the minimum wage from next year, rising to at least $2 above the minimum wage in 2009. That's all in good uh, when you see it on paper or you hear people talking about it, but when you look at the, uh, the statistics of the whole thing, is how, it, how it operates, it's just a farce. I mean, once again, there's no policing of it. Uh, some of the documents are falsified as far as the Guild's concerned or, and other agencies. And as far as we're concerned that, you know, with the wages, there's not a level playing field, you know, in this industry. We have seen an increase of the actual crews coming to us asking for help. So whether, whether this new legislation is helping or not, I don't know. There still is, in my mind, a fundamental difficulty. And that is that it's very difficult to track a payment from a charterer or a vessel owner through to the crewman himself. What typically happens is that a crew are engaged to work on these vessels through the agency of a foreign crewing or manning agent. It is very difficult to track the payments from the crewing agents back to the crewmen themselves. So whilst the legislation seeks to improve and better the position of these crew members, quite often the execution may be flawed and it's very difficult for the Department of Labour or for that matter the charters to determine whether in fact these crew have been, been paid in the way that they should be in terms of the legislation. The other thing is too how do you monitor it? How do you, how do you show the people that, the, that these things have improved? And until the government or the ministry or the immigration department wake up to that it's never going to go away. Finally, in October 2006, the Department of Labour, the Seafood Industry Council representing the fishing industry and the Fishing Industry Guild officially agreed on a code of practice. While covering numerous areas that certainly needed improvement such as employer responsibilities, crew welfare, working and living conditions, there was an opt-out clause inserted in the agreement. It is acknowledged that the fishing industry participants have not agreed to the requirements in respect of minimum levels of remuneration. So it wasn't just the fish that were being gutted. The vested interests of a few outweighed the interests of the many New Zealand fishermen struggling to keep their livelihood afloat. We invited the heads of Sanfords, Sea Lord and Independent Fisheries to appear on this program. They all declined. Under the new rules, New Zealand companies will have to guarantee basic paying conditions. It says a requirement that a New Zealand party acts as guarantor to ensure crew are paid what they are owed. That says nothing to me. Um, what it says is, is a, you know, um, how do we check on what they are owed? Who um, says what they are owed? The company. We don't have a crewman that can come to us and we, we haven't had a crewman come to us and say definitely that this is what we've done. You know, we've had some say, we've worked 2,000 some odd hours. Well, we've got nothing to verify that he's right and we've got nothing to verify that the company's right. You know, we've only got to take their word. So how do you, how do you control that? Unless you have the company registering hours weekly with a government department so there is a standard or, or, or a set of figures that you can work off, that means nothing. So in your experience this doesn't happen? No, I don't believe it does, no. And if it does happen, you're not able to access those records no. anyway? No, any, any attempt that we've made to access um, records of, uh, we've, we've run into a blank to my knowledge. And again, you know, it's like we won a, won a um, a claim against a one company uh, for payment of lost wages, but they reneged on it. You know, so there's nothing there to say that they have to do it. 
So in your experience, cooperation is the last thing you hear? We don't get a lot of cooperation. This merely illustrates the point that the legislation that governs crew and crew arrangements is a hodgepodge of conflicting statutes um, with the consequence that it is difficult to determine clearly what rights and duties fall to which parties, particularly where you have an owner, a local charterer and a foreign crewman. And within the scope of that there's ample ground for unscrupulous operators to um, uh, abuse their crew. Next, we show how foreign fishing vessels' practices dramatically impact on the smaller New Zealand fishing boats. I'd watch this little living I was making just disappear. They turned up and the fish disappeared. While the third world wages creates a massive commercial advantage, it's the imported fishing practices of these foreign vessels that impacts heavily upon the smaller fishing operators. In 1982, a trainee deckhand on a Japanese vessel was experiencing firsthand these illegal practices. One of them was dumping hokey on the west coast where we were ordered to shovel it over the side, which we did. Um, another was catching hake which was clearly inside the line and one of our officers, Kiwi officers, was upstairs on the bridge and can verify this and we overcaught and we had to dump a whole lot of that hake as well which is a shameful waste. I've seen inch mesh cod end liners sewn into a cod end in order to catch juvenile fish and uh, we were hauled into the office when I took a few photos of this upon return and uh, we had the opportunity to either walk and lose our job or or shut up and stay on the job. So these are the sorts of things that have gone on in the past. Some of those types of vessels are still fishing in this country and I wonder whether or not their attitudes and practices to the fishery and the respect for the fishery that we have is being reflected in what they do. These guys come into our country with no uh, regard to the longevity of our fishery. They're just here to grab it and get what they can and leave again. They don't, they've got no interest at all about about uh, our fish stocks or anything else. And it's shows in the way they fish and their attitudes. I mean, most of the major cases have been against foreign boats. When we come to the overfishing, one of our major problems is the Blue Warrior that has been targeted and caught by Korean vessels down by Stewart Island. Ministry of Fisheries figures back this up. Within a recent five-year period, overcatching of blue warrior in this area was a massive 4,200 tonnes. The fine for this overcatch, called deep value, was $1.8 million. But with a market value of $6.3 million, it's easy to see why some companies target deep value and cop the fine rather than pay more for additional quota. One particular company only holds eight tonne of quota in a court excess of a thousand tonne. Now, they're utilising the Dean Value system against us. And basically, what they're doing is not illegal, but is immoral, and it's way out of kilter with the spirit of the quota system. It is not illegal to overcatch. It is illegal to overcatch and not cover your quota. Responsible operators like to work against balanced portfolios and there's an obligation on them to try and do such things. However, there are operators out there that choose to do the exact opposite. They choose to harvest fish without quota. They choose to harvest fish knowing full well that the cost structures allow for them to harvest it without any significant penalty. The knock-on effect of this behaviour is that fishing communities along the coastlines of both islands suffer greatly. We catch blue warrior on the west coast and the east coast and we're definitely noticing a, a, a noticeable drop in our catches so it would seem that the spin-off from the way they've been operating is that we're paying the price. 
about in the mid 90s there was this great little inshore warahel fishery of Taranaki here and um, there's quite a few little day boats like half a dozen guys that had backed their tra boats in on their tractors and trailers in the morning and go out and haul their nets and catch this warahel and they'd make a living out of it and the fish and chip shops would all sell it around here and that and then it just started not showing up and at first everyone thought it was bad seasons and we're at sort of at the northern end of everything here. So the rumours finally got up here that they were trawling it down south somewhere and there's no one doing it now. If they thrash it down there, it doesn't even reach up here and you know we're just less than 40 tonne thinking oh well, you know we'll need some, if it does turn up we'll need it so at the start of the year you've got to lease it in and if it's hammered down the coast you know, it's, it's lost out of our pocket because the fish doesn't turn up here. The whole thing with charter boats, do they have an effect here? Well, do they what? Um, the guy that behind me and myself have noticed a huge downturn in our QMA2 Wario fishery. Um, the last really good year we had is eight years ago and it's been steadily declining in a sharp sort of crashing manoeuvre and this year is the worst I've ever seen it in the whole 25 years I've been trawling. Cynics could point out that it's in the financial interests of some quota owners who charter foreign vessels to encourage massive overfishing, forcing the Ministry to ramp up the deemed value, or fines, to an exorbitant level, thereby massively increasing the cost of quota, which in turn increases the value of the quota portfolio. And their investment. The downside to this is that lease fees for fish quota increase dramatically as well, and this is yet another area where the smaller Kiwi fisherman is hit hard. Lease prices have to come back to realistic prices. Gone are the days that I feel of investors owning everything and getting the most for their money, because it's just hurting the fishermen that are meant to be making this multi-million dollar fishing business in New Zealand a fishing business. Because at the end of the day, if it wasn't for us out there catching it as private owners, who's going to be out there catching it? If New Zealand guys were allowed to lease it at a reasonable rate, we would survive, the companies would get the fish, and the country would get the benefit of it. And that's when it becomes hard. When you've had to lease in something as part of a parcel, you've paid out the money, and then it doesn't turn up. It still cost you money. We lease in Warrior, Blue Warrior quota, and you know, that's over caught by foreign boats of thousands of tonnes, and we have to pay to lease that quota in where they can just go and, you know, overcatch it as much as they want, because they're still making money on it. Because they don't pay New Zealand taxes, or ACC and things like that, they can keep their costs down, they pay their crews bugger all, and they can keep their costs down so they can still afford to process some of that fish and make money out of it, whereas we can't. It just makes it harder and harder for the New Zealand guy to stay there. We can't compete with that, that's the thing, but it shouldn't be that way, that's just totally wrong how it's happening. Why should we lease in that quota when you know you don't know if it's going to turn up or not and have that money out going? Why not do it like the others? You know, just oh, well, if it turns up, we'll just deem it and hopefully make money on it. You know, it's a it's just a mockery to me because that then encourages overcatch. Yeah. yeah, and then the whole industry just gets knocked. Yep, and then you know everyone hates it. You know, we get a lot of flack from recreationals about overcatching and all that, but. You know, we, we ourselves try our best not to do it, but we still get penalised, you know, bad mouth and whatever by, by those people because of people blatantly doing it. Yeah, so a few would ruin it for a lot. Yeah. yeah, and that's why the Dean values have all gone up, is to cover those ones that were blatantly doing it, because what they were doing was not illegal. All they had to do was pay the fine at the end of the day, sort of thing.
After overfishing the Warahau grounds, the Koreans' next target is the Teraki grounds off Banks Peninsula. The Teraki grounds have been decimated. There's nothing left. Our, our winter fishery is gone. And unless we can stop these vessels coming in there, it's never going to recover. So we went out for a night's fishing to see for ourselves the impact these Korean vessels are having. The quota fish we were after was Teraki. After a four hour trawl, things weren't looking good. The catch we've had here is rubbish really. But you know, we're forced to go into less preferred grounds because the Koreans have already been working on the point of Teraki grounds. And they've already decimated it. Where we would normally be working, it's gone. What was the catch? One red cod, two rig, two gear, three skate, and one spike in on. Yay. Yay. How's that? Nine bins of fish for four hours towing. Two and a half cases of tow. Two, two and a half cases in there. Any no, Cherokee no, no. no Cherokee. No Cherokee. That's not bad for target species, is it? On a normal good trip, how does that compare? <laughs> We'd be going home. We'd be going home. If it was a good, good, good shot, we would be going home. But how many bits would you expect on a good shot? Oh, a couple of hundred. Say? That's why it's so depressing. Yeah, it's, um, last time we were out here, I think the uh, first tow we had 140 of Cherokee, cases of Cherokee. It was 68 of dogs and about 15 bins of other fish. Tonight? Nine bins of fish in total. And no charity. And no charity. This is a long standing argument I've had for the last 20 years out here. There's no New Zealand boats work out there, none of our big boats work out there. They all stay outside 450 metres. It's only the Koreans and the Japanese that work inside the 80 metres on the fleet. You know, for some reason, they just seem to work where they want impunity. Even when the fishing is good for Ross and his crew, another important issue arises, which perfectly illustrates why there needs to be observers full-time on foreign vessels. According to their catch logs, they're only catching barracuda, squid and mackerel. You're right as the Tui's head goes. You know, we're a lot of, we've been working alongside them catching Cherokee, Groper, Blue Cod, Red Cod. Now, you can't tell me the vessels that size working right alongside us through the middle of our Cherokee grounds are not catching Cherokee. So they're not entering it? What? That's the conclusion that, you can reach? Well, you can reach any conclusion you like. But if their catch logs say they're only catching barracuda, squid and mackerel, either, <laughs> you know, it, it's... Uh... After a second four-hour tow that was just as bad as the first, Ross called it a night. Five hours journey to the grounds, two four-hour tows, and then home, used $1,800 worth of fuel. Crew costs, ministry compliance costs and levies took another $1,200. With only $1,300 worth of fish to sell and $3,000 of costs to pay, this was an expensive trip. Talk to many commercial fishermen and you will find this example is not an uncommon story.
Another good illustration of how foreign vessels dramatically affect the local fishing industry can be found every year off the North Island. This is a photo I took of a radar while I was out fishing out off New Plymouth and what it shows is seven Russian factory trawlers all ganged up together towing in a big line which is five miles wide on the radar and how we know this is because the radar is set on 12 miles which is that which makes this five miles wide. Now these guys work off the west coast of the North Island from Manukau right down to Fairwell Spit which is the top of the South Island three months of the year with huge nets. These boats nets are 150 metres wide each and 90 metres in depth and they're allowed right into our 12 mile limit and when they're ganged up like this you're talking five miles and 90 metres they're fishing as close in as 90 metres of water so they cover the whole water depth plus that five miles apart and they're towing 24 7 for three months so the amount of water they fish is, is unreal, they catch everything. We, we went out there and started blue nosing and started doing quite good. And the, the Russians turned out there. And the whole thing just fell to bits on us. Like I watched, I'd watched this little living I was making just disappear. They turned up and the fish disappeared. They wrecked them all for it. Oh, they, they did. Like that, that first year I was doing it, that spring they came and towed methodically every blue nose ridge in Area 8. Every one of them. And after that, you didn't get anything? No, it was just dead. Like, I actually had to do a trip away and work out of uh, Manganui in the far north for, for a few months because. We were doing whole days for one bins of blue nose and stuff like that. And like we, we would go out there and and catch a ton. We'd catch one every hook until they turned up. And um, like I reckon if they hadn't have turned up, they would have been able to sustain the blue. They've actually cut all the blue nose quota last year because it's disappearing. Well, it hasn't been caught by the bottom liners, not the New Zealand guys. Ministry of Fisheries records show that in the last 10 years the amount of blue nose caught in this area has dropped by as much as 85%. Of course they say they're not catching any, but like they can't DNA test fish meal. Like, like no observers on there, what's to say they don't do a 30 tonne bag of blue nose, fish meal it up and go in and say it was Frostfish, which they, they've got plenty of quota and there's a crack fish that no one wants, nothing. And I don't know, but I, I haven't seen it, but shit, my suspicion is that's exactly what they're doing. When they're out there, our prime species of John Dory, Terrakee, Gurnet, and even Snapper, the catch declines when those boats are in the area. And they tell us they're midwater trawling for, for jack mackerel, but we fail to see how that they're not catching those prime species because when we're midwatering for hokey, we catch bycatch as well, like blue nose and stuff like that. So I don't believe the Russians are that clever that they can manage to get their nets to dodge those prime species of fish. And does it drop off quite dramatically? Yes, it does. And it's, um, since they've been there, the, the fishing has dropped off considerably what it was when we first started fishing that area. And it's not just commercial fishermen that are affected by this Russian method of fishing. Four years ago my son Richard came back from Greece where there's very few fish and he decided we needed to have a bit of a project. We've got very little information on the west coast kingfish stocks and it's a great sport fish so we decided that that was the project we were going to adopt. Since that time we've tagged over 700 kingfish 
and we're starting to get some really good returns. We get good returns from the inshore commercial fleet and from recreational fishers of course, but where we're missing, sadly missing, is with the joint venture boats. We get returns from boats that have observers on, but we haven't had any returns from any of the boats that don't have observers on. Observers work for the Ministry of Fisheries and it's their job to make sure fishermen are recording every fish species that they catch and the amounts. I sort of talked to the math guys when I asked, could you talk to some of the observers and see what they're catching? And they come back to me and go, oh, we just found out that they don't look at as jack mackerel as a high risk fishing industry, so they had enough observer hours to put one man on one boat for one truck. And we had seven 300 foot factory trawlers up here working the whole season and they had one guy who can't even watch them around the clock. And I'm like thinking, what's that about? What are these guys doing? Just seems completely wrong, doesn't it? The foreign charter vessels don't have a balanced portfolio of quota. So when they overcatch fish, they're catching our fish. And in the kingfish fishery, there's a significant overcatch of, of quota, and that's our fish, and that's impacting on us and our ability to catch fish for our for ourselves, for either for the sport of it or for our tables. When we're out there fishing, you know, you're probably doing anything up to 50 bins a shot. And um, when they arrive on the scene, it'll drop down to 10, 12 bins a shot and just it makes it uneconomical to carry on fishing. So you just, you got to leave the area. And they obviously they're still catching fish with the size gear they take compared to us. We just cannot compete. How does that make you feel? Highly pissed off and wonder what the hell they're doing here catching our fish. They could be caught by Kiwi boats. Every fish they take that's in excess of quota is taking fish off recreational fishes and we've really had enough of that happening. They catch huge amounts of fish. Like these boats cut their teeth and were built for the North Sea. And why aren't they up there now fishing? It's because there's no fish left. Everyone knows the North Sea has been completely raped of fish. And it's these exact boats that have done it. This is a type of behaviour that simply must stop. We cannot continue to operate responsibly under a quota management system thinking that this is an acceptable practice. Until they do have an observer on all these vessels, we're never going to solve any problems with the, the catching ability of the vessel, the reporting ability of the vessel. Next, we reveal foreign fishing vessels' shocking secret and environmental groups' selective silence. Ninety percent of all common dolphins killed are by vessels trawling for jack mackerel. In the last six years, Ministry of Fisheries records show foreign fishing vessels killed 108 dolphins. New Zealand vessels killed five. These Ministry photographs were all taken on board foreign fishing vessels. Is it not fair to assume that if there are observers on every one of these foreign vessels 24-7 while fishing for jack mackerel, then the numbers reported of dolphins killed would skyrocket? Last year, the foreign joint venture boats fishing off the west coast killed 22 common dolphins. And yet, it wasn't reported in any paper except the Nelson Mail and then when it's been reported just recently, it's once again made to sound like the entire commercial fleet of New Zealand, where it's actually not. It's the joint venture boats. And let's face it, the countries they come from, if it swims, they eat it. 
What is surprising is that the two organisations most vocal against New Zealand fishermen over Hector and Maui dolphin deaths make no mention at all about foreign vessels killing common dolphins. A real frustration within the New Zealand commercial fishing fleet at the moment is the attack that we continually receive from environmentalists. This is not a balanced attack and there's no distinction made in the case of common dolphins in respect of actually who's catching them. The New Zealander provides a very responsible approach to the fisheries management within New Zealand. New Zealand fishermen also suffer through foreign vessels overfishing practices, which often cause fish stocks to decline, forcing the ministry to substantially reduce quota. The irony is that what quota is left usually goes to foreign vessels and not to New Zealand fishermen. With a reduction in some of those quotas, the bigger companies needed to find other quota to give to these joint venture boats to keep them in the country to make it viable for them to be here. And by supplying them with that quota, they've taken it away from the New Zealand fleet. An Auckland-based fishing firm is the target of one of the biggest civil cases ever taken by the Fisheries Ministry. Able Fishing faces over 230 charges. The company hired five Russian trawlers two years ago. Its alleged hooky were taken without quota. The company could be fined up to a quarter of a million dollars for each offence. A five-month probe has ended with the seizure of one of the largest boats fishing in New Zealand for having too much hockey. Fisheries Ministry officials boarded the Japanese-owned and operated vessel this morning. They allege it's been catching up to 20% more hockey than has been declared. A lot of the decline in the hockey fisheries has been from poor practices by the charter fleet, not from the New Zealand fleet. I think the main reasons of the quota cuts in the last couple of rounds have been from overfishing or fish dumping from the charter fleet not from Kiwi-owned boats. Tons of fish have been confiscated from a Korean vessel accused of overfishing off the South Island. Fisheries officers say the boat had more fish in its hold than was noted in its records and may now face prosecution. The quota cuts that, that affected us the most, I guess, would be the hokey. It'd be, it'd be a good subject to speak of because that's the fish that the charter boats, the foreign boats, catch a lot of. Between 2002 and 2007, the hokey quota was reduced from 250,000 tonnes to 90,000 tonnes. Hokie is financially the most valuable fish to catch, and export earnings dropped from $346 million to $93 million. This reduction had a massive impact on the smaller New Zealand fishermen. In our situation, the West Bay used to catch about 2,500 tonne of hokey every year. That was good. We made a good living, our crew made a good living, and everything was fine. The quota cuts come along, and I, and I firmly believe we needed those quota cuts, and, and there's no issue. We don't have an issue with, I mean, the fishermen suggested these cuts, for goodness sake. So we don't have an issue with those cuts. The fishery needed them. Um, but the fact is, once it was all washed up and finished, the quota cuts left us after a period of years with a catch of about 650 tonne, which wasn't economic for our boat. So we end up selling our boat and getting out of it. And these companies, because they can afford to pay big money to secure the quota to keep these boats going, ready to catch the hokey again the next season. And the availability for quota for us, A, isn't there, and B, it's, it's just got so expensive we can't afford to catch it and compete on the market. So, uh, I mean, that's the effect of the joint venture boats on us, inshore boats and, and owner operators is it's just cutting us out of the industry. There was plenty of fish we could have carried on catching our 2,500 if that quota wasn't going to the foreigners. There was, you know, the, the total New Zealand catch still fits within the quota that's there. But these guys, they take the fish out like they always were and that doesn't leave enough for us guys. So our guys got to sit on the wharf and watch the, the foreign charter boats come and unload the fish that they would have gone and caught and made a wage from and contributed to our economy with, you know? This is a nonsense. The reality is New Zealand has the domestic capacity with the quotas set at 90,000 tonnes today that allows New Zealand inshore fishermen to continue harvesting, arguably, their own fish. The economic impact from so much quota going to foreign vessels and the New Zealand fishermen suffering financially trying to earn a reasonable income from their own catch cannot be underestimated. 
Not only is the New Zealand economy missing out every year on tens of millions of dollars in tax and ACC payments, but also from the much higher wages paid to New Zealand crews that would be spent in New Zealand communities. The economy also suffers from reduced demand for fishing support industries such as engineering works, marine, fuel and food suppliers and the wider commercial environment of local businesses, shops, supermarkets and hotels. They all suffer. Twelve years ago, the fishing industry was worth an estimated $400 million to the Nelson economy. Today, that contribution has dropped to $220 million. This is an economic scenario that is being repeated in coastal communities all around New Zealand. Not only did they miss out on the, on the fish that we would have caught, they missed out on the income from it. The country missed out on the tax and the ACC from their income and their, their flow on effect from their wages that they spend in the towns. But it's not just the lost income that affects the New Zealand economy. When the value of processed hokey is compared, the difference can be measured in millions of dollars. Hokey processed on New Zealand factory trawlers end up as high quality export grade fillets destined for top restaurants around the world. Hokey processed on these Russian vessels is headed and gutted, then frozen in blocks, sent overseas to China where it will be processed into supermarket frozen fish products. One tonne of fresh hokey provides revenues of $2,300 from a Russian vessel and $3,700 from a New Zealand vessel. The difference from 50,000 tonnes of fresh hokey is a staggering $70 million. Once again, we New Zealanders miss out on much needed income from a valuable New Zealand resource. We're not saying let's fish as much as we can ourselves and try and increase our margin and our productivity, our GDP down here. And that's why, in my heart of hearts, I have to say that foreign charter vessels are just not the way forward. They were the way forward in the past, but those days have long gone. Next, disillusion as a billion dollars of fishery assets fails to create a vibrant Māori fishing industry. There's no incentive for young, especially young Māori, to get into the fishing industry. The employment outcomes that they could have legitimately look forward to through a company in which they've got a major stake are not there because they're being taken by Russian crews. In 1989, under Treaty of Waitangi Settlement, iwi were given 10% of all existing quota, with the agreement that they would get 20% of any new quota. Then in 1992, the government paid $150 million for half of Sea Lord then New Zealand's largest fishing and processing company, and gave that to Iwi as well. At last, Māori had the opportunity to own and run their own assets, develop their own fishing fleet, and provide training and secure jobs, especially for young Māori. We got so excited about the Sea Lord Settlement deal, and we thought, wow, this is, this is, this is it, this is our opportunity. And Bought a boat overseas in partnership with Ngāti Kahungunu Runanga, with myself as the skipper, um, deck boss, and our friend who was the shore manager, who's a Kiwi of European descent. And we all got together and steamed the boat over from Australia, filled up with fish on the way home, and had a great start to the venture. Now, from that moment, we took on board cadets and trained them up and uh, put them through their courses out of the company without funding from anyone. It's just what we wanted to do in order to, to be ready, do our part to be ready for this fishing asset that was coming back and to, to New Zealandise the fishery. And that was something that we were passionately excited about. Over the years, I've been um a part of a training organisation back in Gisborne which we did take on inexperienced young Māori fishermen, put them on my vessel, put them through sea time and train them right through to be qualified fishing deckhands. Um, we've currently stopped that basically because no, there's no incentive for young, especially young Māori to get into the fishing industry. 
Over the last 10 years, Sea Lord has had five CEOs. Three of its four deep sea factory trawlers have been sold off, relying instead on this fleet of Russian vessels. It's frustrating to see that while we're training people and, and raising their capacity and bringing them up on the one hand, the employment outcomes that they could have legitimately looked forward to through a company in which they've got a major stake are not there because they're being taken by Russian crews. And it's not just the Russians catching Māori quota. One example is New Zealand's largest even, Nati Napui. With its $67 million fisheries package, it has, for the last 10 years, been using this Korean vessel to catch its deep sea quota. For me, it's outrageous that we should be receiving these assets and not using a multiple measurement of value to create jobs for our people in this country. We need to get onto that quick smart. They've got a lot of quota, a lot of assets, a lot of shares, um, so there's no reason why they can't put a program together or we'll get some proper training done to actually help and encourage young Māori fishermen to get out there and work because they do want to work, there's no doubt about it, but it's getting access to the work. And if you haven't got a reliable source of income, no one's going to be there. When Iwi were given 50% ownership of Sea Lord, one of the selling points was the creation of 800 new jobs, in particular to get young Māori off welfare. Sea Lord also set itself the target of Māori holding a quarter of all senior management jobs by 2008. Jobs for Māori was very much the mantra. I think uh, one of the most telling pieces of statistic which, that, that um, emerged yesterday was the uh, employment figures relating to Māori in the fishing industry. In 1991 there were something like 6,000 people employed in the industry and 16% of those were, were Māori. 1996, 7,500 people employed in the industry, 21% Māori. 1,600 new jobs were created, 42% of them are Māori. In our subsidiaries, 35% of our employees are Māori. The largest Māori-owned fishing company is Aotearoa Fisheries. It owns Moana Pacific, one of New Zealand's largest inshore fishing companies, and 50% of New Zealand's largest deep sea fishing company, Sea Lord. In the last three years, Sea Lord has cut 800 jobs from its workforce. Last year, they got rid of the last Māori in senior management. When asked to comment, Robin Huppy, now executive chair of Aotearoa Fisheries, and Chair of Sea Lord replied. It kind of makes a mockery of training all these people for what? Where is their career path when that, that support isn't coming from holders of our own asset? There's no way that a, a new chum can come in without the experience, without the financial backing and make a good living as a commercial fisherman, um, which is a big shame, especially for young Māori fishermen with the assets and quota that's been allocated over the years. We need to move away from money being the single measure of benefit. Now that we've got the settlement of our quota and our assets, we need to measure that benefit more widely because if we focus solely on the money, then with a clear conscience, foreign vessels can come in and catch that fish. If we focus on the other reasons for existing, then we have to have regard for other things, like employment of our people. That's where it comes down to Māori's helping Māori's. Um, iwis being iwis, pooling the quota together. They may get a better revenue from leasing out the quota, as a big package, as long as, a, as, long as us as individual Māori fishermen are, have access to that quota. We have to pay for it just like everyone else, but the hardest part for us is getting access to it. 
To concerned Māori, employment is the major issue, and when you look at the statistics, it's not hard to see why. Māori unemployment is at 10%, compared with a national average of 5%. For Māori youth aged 15 to 19, unemployment numbers rise dramatically to 17%. We can see the stats and see that that's an area we need to address. So why have one policy that doesn't address that through foreign vessels and meanwhile lament the problem over here? We're in a, we've got an opportunity to do something about it and we must. Māori now owns 35% of all New Zealand's fish quota with a value of over $1 billion. There has been massive expectation about what that could deliver for our people in terms of resource management, employment, being in the business and in the activity of fishing. What we've found is that those things haven't really materialised to the degree that a lot of people had wanted. We wait. Some can wait no longer. One month after his interview, BJ sold his 60-foot boat and is now skipper on a fishing boat in Australia. There's some leeway with fuel or lease fees coming down or the price of fish per kilo going up to the fishermen that actually catch the fish. There is some hope left for private owners to carry on in the industry. But as it stands at the moment, I find it very hard for people, especially with one boat, to um, stay in the commercial fishing industry and have a happy lifestyle. And it's not going to happen. Like I've seen it at its best and I don't want to be there when it's right at its worst. After the break, BJ is just one of 500 who have left the New Zealand fishing industry to take up jobs overseas. They're fishing in South Africa, they're fishing in Australia, other parts of the world because they are being replaced by foreigners. We'll have no fish left in this country if it carries on. It has to be stopped. It's a real problem that's going to come knocking on the door very soon, I think. In 1996, at the height of New Zealandisation, there were over two and a half thousand New Zealand fishing boats. That number has now dropped by over 50% to 1,200 boats. 75 of them gone in the last three months. New Zealand is also losing vast experience from within the fishing industry as well. In the last five years, 574 fishermen and industry workers left New Zealand permanently. They're fishing in South Africa, they're fishing in Australia, other parts of the world because they are being replaced by foreigners. I feel that in years to come that the industry in New Zealand is going to have a lack of experience, skilled skippers, no young guys coming through the ranks, so there's going to be a big void left in the industry when no one's able to go out and catch the fish for them. The industry is just going to disappear in, in the owner-operator area and that's going to become a big point where the, the companies are going to be able to say, well, we've got no guys to catch our fish, we need to use these joint venture boats in that area as well. And it's going to be a, it's a real problem that's going to come knocking on the door very soon, I think. When New Zealandisation really took place back 10 years ago, we had 1,000 members. Now we have 560 members who, are, who man all the deep water boats in New Zealand. So that's just an example of how many jobs have been lost over the years to foreign fishermen. When I first arrived in New Zealand some seven years ago, I was quite surprised to find that there were foreign flagged fishing vessels operating in New Zealand waters, as this was um, quite different to my experience up to that time. Most developed fisheries in which I had been involved previously reserved the fishery for locally flagged, locally owned and operated vessels. I don't see any reciprocity. I can't go to Japan or these other countries and do these things. Why should they come here? It's not a question of being jingoistic or, or narrow-minded. It's just a question of being smart in the way you go about your national economic business. I mean, what we're doing here is diminishing our GDP uh, by giving part of it away to foreign people who just say, 
thanks very much and they can't believe their luck. Somewhat of an irony about the way the New Zealand fishing industry is run is that we will allow charter vessels to come and harvest their own quota knowing full well that internationally countries have blatantly made it clear that they won't have any of it. They don't want charter vessels or international operations within their waters. They've dictated in USA, Japan, Australia, Africa that they will not harvest their fish other than through domestic vessel operations. Both the Department of Labour and the Ministry of Fisheries have the necessary legislative powers to come down hard on foreign vessels, but choose not to. For a ministry that has total regulatory power over its industry, it is incredible that a vast majority of the ministry staff have never set foot on a New Zealand fishing vessel. The Ministry of Fisheries has no passion. The Ministry of Fisheries has a whole host of bureaucrats that are concentrating on keeping their jobs as opposed to actually managing New Zealand's fisheries. We don't have a collaborative approach to fisheries management in New Zealand. We have a, a, a display of command and control whereby the Ministry of Fisheries simply dictate terms or deliver policy. There's not a collaborative approach to the development of policy. The industry continues to work in a reactive environment. We are always reacting to the letter the Ministry sent us as opposed to being part of the letter that was written. One of the real problems of the industry has always been is that they, firstly they never got the support that the farmers got, the primary industry um, always was, they were second rate to the farmers. Although they were a primary industry, they never had the support, they never had the subsidies that the farmers got, they, they, were, they were left much to their own devices and also were expected to pay for much more of what they received. The New Zealand fishing industry is the only major primary producer and exporter that receives no government assistance at all. Agriculture gets $105 million a year in direct grants. Even forestry gets $2 million. This despite annual exports worth $1.3 billion. And to add insult to injury, the industry has to pay for research done by NIWA and other organisations to the tune of $19 million a year, ministry compliance costs of $9 million, and even government administration costs of $5 million. While agriculture and forestry contribute no direct funds to their government departments, the fishing industry provides $33 million a year to the Ministry of Fisheries. It is absolutely imperative that the New Zealand fishing industry is looked at more seriously as the fifth largest primary producer in this country. New Zealand fishermen receive nothing in repayment for that contribution to New Zealand's economy. In fact, they have been driven through the floor in terms of the costs associated with running their businesses incurred by government. I think the way the government needs to look at itself is, is to say, well, hey, you know, the fishermen have to pay for so much, whether it's the research, whether it's the, the, the time on the observers on the boat, whether it's um, deem values across the wharf costs, levies, all the rest of it. I mean, the, the whole industry is jacked up and jacked up to provide revenue for the government. And they've given nothing back to the industry at all. It's all been take, take, take. If you look at the agriculture industry, another primary industry which is hugely important to the country as well, they've always been well looked after. And for some reason the government does not care about the same industry importance that's happening here. We actually export and make lots of overseas funds and have done forever. But the government keeps on wanting us to source and pay them to be a player. It's crazy. If the government wants to help the industry, it has to say, we will stop charging you for all these services, because they're not charging people on the land the same amount. They, I mean, they do give them the special, much, a much better deal. But the fishermen know, the fishermen are paying all along the way. The government clearly needs to think seriously about the future of the New Zealand fishery. They can't just simply keep taking money off us and thinking that they're going to achieve one of the most responsibly and, and well received quota management systems in the world. The key to it, and the, the key to any quota management system is having fishermen. Without fishermen, you don't have any, any system at all. And as long as we continue the way we're going, we're just driving them out of business.
our government allows these big companies to bring in these huge vacuum cleaners and just rape it. Like it's just wrong. And it's all kept just over the horizon, so your average Kiwi can't see it happening. But us fishermen, we're, we're out there and we see it all happening, and, and it's hard to get the New Zealand public, you know, even interested in something they can't see. So why does the government still tolerate foreign fishing vessels in our waters? New Zealand has one of the largest fisheries in the world, and yet we are the only large fishing nation that allows foreign vessels to catch our fish. New Zealand has a small economy, and with the severe global economic crisis impacting here, do we do nothing for another 10 years and let more millions of dollars go to waste, not to mention the lost incomes from fishermen forced out of their own industry? It makes no economic sense at all as a nation to allow these foreign vessels and their crews to continue working here. They don't give a damn about the New Zealand fishing industry. They have no vested interest in it. They've invested no money into it. All they're doing is raping and pillaging it until they're finished and as soon as they've destroyed our fishery here they'll just move on to another country. And the bean counters at these big companies sit there at their tools going ching, 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 ching and we'll have no fish left in this country if it carries on. It has to be stopped. We'll end up with foreign boats fishing closer and closer and the next thing you'll see is the foreign boats fishing right into our 12 mile line and, and inside that because there'll be no New Zealand boats left to do it will be forced out, it'll be easier for the government and the main quota players, they'll be able to employ a handful of boats to catch the resource and a great fleet of New Zealand boats and smaller boats will be gone, they just won't be there anymore and you'll look out your window and see a uh, Korean boat towing down the bay instead of a couple of small New Zealand boats. This is big stuff, if you want your own country to catch your own product then I think it's paramount that the government takes a stand here. We don't need joint ventures. We've got enough boats in New Zealand to catch all our quota. That's the sad thing about it, isn't it? The, the, the fish that we would be catching that's consequently being caught by foreign charter vessels is, is our fish. It's, our, it's us Kiwi people's fish, you know, and we feel as though we have the right to go out and catch that fish and bring it home and sell it and take our wages up, up, to, up to Nelson and buy our new TV for our family to watch or buy a new car for our, take the kids to school in or whatever it may be. It's, it's a it's a New Zealand thing, you know, and, and we feel as though that's our right as, as Kiwis. If the government continues to allow foreign vessels in to catch our fish, and lets the Ministry of Fisheries dictate levies and policies with no consideration for their impact on the health of the industry, then within the next 10 years, the only species seriously facing extinction will be the New Zealand fishermen.